First, may I congratulate all the party award recipients who are receiving the awards this morning. You've worked faithfully and tirelessly, serving the people, engaging many groups, working for the party, building a better Singapore. Many of you have served for decades. Rain or shine, you've always been there putting in your best. There are too many of you to name individually, but just let me share a few examples. Take, for example, Comrade Miranda Oscar from Tlok Blanga branch, who will receive a silver medal later. Comrade Miranda is 70 years young and a grandmother. She has volunteered for many years. She's knocked on many doors, handed out countless pamphlets. Many residents have shared their concerns with her, and she's seen them grown up from when they were little. But she has not stopped walking the ground. And she says, as long as I can contribute, I can't find a reason to say no. Or comrade Daniel Mo Mohammad Kherwan from Sumbawang, who is receiving a youth medal. He's active in the YP. He led a team of volunteers to work with the Family Development Center to bring 30 needy families for a family day out around Singapore, showing how young Singaporeans can give back to the community. Comrade Pan Cheng Xiang from Woodlands, who is receiving a bronze award, he is doing a PhD in NTU, Information Technology, and he's putting his knowledge to good use. He developed an IT system to enable our activists to conduct better outreach to the residents. And he's also active in the PAP Policy Forum, giving ideas on how to use technology to support our aging population. He's a young man, but he's a PG ambassador, reaching out to the old people, developing a game plan. In fact, he developed a game to explain the PG package and MediShield life to the older people. Comrade Gina Ong from Marina Parade, Marine Parade, she's receiving the Women's Medal. She's an active member of the Women's Wing. She's known as the mother of her branch because she takes care of residents and volunteers, putting others before herself. Once she protected a resident whose husband had made his way to the MPS and physically threatened the wife and children. And she calmed him down, diffused the situation. Many, of, many more of you have contributed in your own ways. Every effort counts. I'd like to invite all the recipients to stand up so that we can thank you for your good work. May the recipients stand. Thank you very much indeed. Last year, we had general elections. Every branch fought in the GE. It was a hard-won victory. We are honoured by the strong results and deeply moved by the trust of Singaporeans and the responsibility which has been reposed in us. This year, unexpectedly, we had to fight another election, a by-election in Bukit Batok. It was only one constituency, but it was a tough fight, I can tell you. I call the by-election quickly. Murali and the Bukit Batok branch had very little time to prepare, but they hit the ground running. A by-election is never easy for the ruling party, but fortunately, the PAP branch and team in Bukit Batok were in good shape and had been tending the ground well. Also, fortunately, Murali had been serving in Bukit Batok before, so the residents knew him. And when I asked him to go back to Bukit Batok, 
ringing him up when he was just starting a holiday overseas, he said yes straight away. I think I spoiled his holiday. <laughs> but he came back, he fought, he won. Now he's left a vacancy in Paileba branch. But let me reassure Paileba comrades, we are actively looking, we will find a good man to go to Paileba branch and replace Murali. We are with you, as we are with all the branch members in the opposition wards. We won Bukit Bato convincingly with 60% of the popular vote. It was an important result because what was at stake was not just one seat in Parliament. Bukit Bato also showed that the PAP can win by elections and that voters appreciated what Murali brought. Good character, personal integrity, and no other agenda apart from a dedication to serve people. The branch secretary, comrade Liao Bun Sui, led the team to campaign tirelessly. He's receiving a commendation medal today. It's not just for the by-election, but for consistent and dedicated performance. And it's not just to recognize him, but for the good work of the whole Bukit Bato team. Well done, Bukit Bato. We rejoice that the PAP enjoys strong support from our fellow citizens, but we must never become complacent. We must deliver on our promises, make sure that Singapore continues to succeed, never take the people's mandate for granted. Every election is different. In every GE, we must fight afresh to win the people's trust and mandate Again, a new election, a new electorate, a new PAP team. The next general election is due by 2021. 2021 is not going to be like GE 2015 because the world is entering into a very uncertain phase and the next four years will bring many changes and surprises. And we have to prepare ourselves and work hard to keep Singapore improving, progressing, and to keep improving Singapore's li Singaporeans' lives. So what must we do in order to prepare for GE 2021? Let me say three things. First, we must understand the big changes which are going on in the world. Second, in a difficult environment, we must improve the lives of Singaporeans. And thirdly, we must keep the PAP strong so that we can unite Singaporeans and take Singapore forward. Let me talk about them one by one. First, we have to understand big changes in the world and what they mean for Singapore. In many developed countries, in America and Europe, people are feeling a profound sense of discontent, angst. You look at Brexit in the UK. David Cameron called a referendum on whether Britain should stay in the EU, remain in the EU, or leave the EU. He thought it was quite safe. There will be song and dance. Your people will vote in the end. People will vote to stay. They were wrong. It seemed like a reasonable expectation that you know, people would be okay with the status quo, but after a nasty campaign focused on immigration, the British voted to leave. Big uncertainty for Britain, for Europe, for the world. Take the US presidential elections. Another very nasty campaign. The pollsters and the media expected Hillary Clinton to win. 
It seemed like a reasonable expectation. But Donald Trump won, riding a tide of anger, resentment, and discontent. Why was there such unhappiness in the UK and also in the US? Two different countries, but similar sentiments. Because many voters felt that their lives had not improved for many years. The economy might be growing, but the benefits were not reaching them. People feel cheated, abandoned. They were anxious about their lives, about their children's future. And there were questions of identity too. Immigration and race became hot issues. Immigration was changing the complexion of the societies. The economy benefited from immigration, but the immigrants also competed for jobs. And the voters could see their neighborhoods were changing, becoming alien, unfamiliar, and they felt their own place in the country threatened. So their societies became divided, the young versus the old, the well-educated versus the less educated, Liberals versus the conservatives, the white majority versus the growing minorities, and the cosmopolitan elite versus the lower and middle class heartlanders. And there's a geographic element too, because these are big countries. In America, the Midwest, the Rust Belt, voted Republican. The West Coast, prospering California, the East Coast, New York, Boston, prospering, voted Democrat. In Britain, London, prospering, voted to stay in the EU. The metropolitan areas did, around London. The rest of England, they were left out from the prosperity, left out from the party. They said, let's leave. So the country is split in many directions. The voters are fed up not just with particular parties or individual leaders, but with a whole system, with a whole political caste, because they felt the elite is out of touch and the system is not working for them. So it doesn't matter whether the other chap has a solution or not, he will break the system, let's vote for change. And this is a mood not just in Britain, not just in America, but also in many countries in Europe, and you see all over Europe, parties far right, far left, gaining ground. The moderate parties, broad coalitions, losing ground. In Netherlands, Geert Wilders, leader of an extreme right party, he's leading in the polls. And his party manifesto says, ban all mosques. They don't want Muslims, because they have quite a big Muslim minority in the Netherlands. In France, you've heard of Marine Le Pen. She leads the National Front, a far-right party. In Spain, you may have heard of Podemos, a left-wing party, came from nowhere to challenge the existing parties and the status quo. In Germany, there's AFD, Alternative for Deutschland a far-right party. They are doing well in the elections. They beat Mer Mrs. Merkel's own party in Mrs. Merkel's home state. So on both the extreme left and on the extreme right, the extreme parties are strengthening, gaining support. They can't govern. They have no workable alternatives. But the voters still support them. Doesn't matter. Bring the house down. Worryingly, next year is going to be election season in Europe. In fact, today, there's a referendum in Italy. If the outcome goes against the Prime Minister, Renzi, who is a reformist, he said he's going to resign, he will have to resign. Italy will be back with no government, and there'll be uncertainty and confusion again. Austria is voting for its president today, and it looks 
possible that the person who will win will be Mr. Norbert Hofer, who's an extreme right-wing candidate, and he has a good chance of winning. And if he does, that's the first extreme right-wing head of state in the EU. More elections next year. Netherlands in March, France and Germany in May and September. In France, people don't expect Le Pen to win. In Germany, people don't expect Angela Merkel to lose. But still, people do expect that whoever wins in France and Germany, the result will be a more divided country. And if by some chance Le Pen wins or Merkel loses, then that's a radically different Europe and a profoundly different world. These are changes which affect not just the individual countries, but also the whole international order, the whole international environment, the world we live in. For more than half a century, at least since the 1960s, all the developed countries shared the same broad objective of prosperity and the shared perspective on international cooperation. Of course, there was competition and rivalry. There was a Cold War, there were tensions, there were conflicts between different countries in different parts of the world. But overall, the prevailing ethos, the spirit of the times, was to open up, cooperate, trade, prosper together. Now, the developed countries are turning inwards, adopting a more protectionist, a more nativist approach. What do I mean? By that, nationalism has turned on its head. Instead of being open and self-confident, proud of their own countries, seeking win-win opportunities with other countries, now voters have become insecure, inward-looking, anxious about their future. When others succeed, they don't see win-win opportunities. They think of it as a win-lose outcome. They don't want others to win. They want to win. And so, they try to shut themselves from the rest of the world. It looks strongly the trend now. I don't know how far this trend will go, but I don't like the direction the trend is going. Because if more countries turn this way, the world is going to change, and it's going to change for the worse. And the impact is not just economics and trade, but also the security, stability, peace, and international order. And this will have major consequences, especially for small and open countries like Singapore. We've always depended on open trade, making friends around the world, looking for opportunities to cooperate with others. We've relied on a peaceful and secure Asia an international order where countries, big and small, cooperate and compete according to rules which are fair to all, where small countries have a right to a place in the sun. And that's how we've prospered these last 50 years. Yes, we've worked very hard and we earned our success, but we were also very lucky to enjoy this international environment. We attracted foreign investments, we negotiated FTAs, we worked with other countries, we expanded our exports, we traded, we prospered. Now, countries are flexing their muscles, becoming increasingly assertive. Nobody can tell how the relations between the big powers will develop. And particularly, Everybody is watching carefully relations between the U.S. and China. If U.S.-China relations grow tense, Singapore is going to be in a very difficult spot because we regard both the U.S. and China as our friends and we do not have to want to have to choose between them. At the same time, world trade is flat, obstacles to trade are increasing, our exports are not growing very much. It's harder for countries to prosper together, to achieve win-win outcomes. 
You take the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. We worked very hard for it. Twelve countries spent six years negotiating the TPP, including the US and Singapore. We all negotiated hard, and all 12 were satisfied at the end we signed. This is a good deal. But now, America has a new president, and the President Trump has declared that the TPP is bad for the US, and he's going to pull the US out of the TPP. Without the US, there's no TPP. We have to accept the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. We still hope that one day we will have a regional trade deal which will include the US, include Singapore, include Japan and the other big countries. But it's a long way off. And meanwhile, we have to make the best of this situation. We have to continue to pursue trade liberalization with others in the region. For example, we have another set of initials, RCEP. It means the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. A different group, we have Japan, we have Korea, we have China, we have the ASEAN countries, we have India, we have Australia and New Zealand, and Singapore ourselves. So we can't get the TPP, we have another free trade arrangement. Not the same, but let's make the best we can of this. And we must continue to cooperate with the major powers, with America, with China, with Europe, with ASEAN, and the others. We ourselves in Singapore must stay open, because if we close up like other countries, our people will be finished. So the external world is changing on us, and changing in a very fundamental way, not advantageous to us, and we have to watch this, and we have to know how this is going to impact us over the next few years. And that brings me to the second challenge we have, which is to improve the lives of Singaporeans despite this uncertain environment. If you compare Singapore with other developed countries, we have been fortunate. We face some of the same challenges. Growth has slowed, outlook uncertain, restructuring, people worried about jobs, anxious about the future. But overall, we are much better off than the other countries. Others are struggling with high unemployment, but our unemployment rate is low, 3% for Singaporeans. And we are still creating more jobs than there are Singaporeans to fill them. And we are creating better jobs for the future for our people. In other countries, households have seen incomes stagnate for a long time. In Singapore, household incomes are going up across the board, even for the lower income and the middle income households. Other governments are tight on money, cutting social, social safety nets, social security. In Singapore, we are careful with our money too, but we are able to strengthen our social safety nets and to give Singaporeans reassurance, support, confidence that we are all in this alone. We are working together. And for that, I think Singaporeans can take credit. The PAP government can take credit. We came together. We did the right things. We delivered the results for the country. But given the difficulties ahead, we'll have to strive even harder. First, we have to equip Singaporeans with the skills to look after ourselves. And that's why we are so focused on education. And I think we can say we have got good results in education. If you look at the latest results, I don't mean the PSLE results, but the TIMS, which is an international survey on maths and science of many countries, the results just came out a few days ago. We are ranked right at the top for maths, for science, for primary schools, for secondary schools. We are the best in the world. I think we can be very proud of that because we are the best in the world, not just the top students, but the whole group of all our Singapore students are doing well. 
We have weak students. We have people who are not so good at maths, not so good at science. We work harder to help them. But if you compare Singapore with other countries, we have fewer weak students than any other country in the world. And I think that's a tribute to the parents, to the kids, and also to the teachers who have worked so hard to help every kid, every school. I think you know what I'm going to say next. Every school is a good school. It's a great boost to our reputation with investors, but also it's a great reassurance to us, to our people, that we can look after ourselves. We have the skills and knowledge. We are competitive. We can take jobs. And that's why when our students graduate, they have jobs. They all have jobs. It may take a little bit longer to find one this year because the economy is a bit slow, but you can find jobs. There are many. And it's different in Europe. It's different in even in other Asian countries, even Taiwan or Korea or Hong Kong, where youth unemployment is high, we don't have a youth unemployment problem. So the first thing we must do is to look, make sure our people can look after themselves. Of course, we look after our workers too through Skills Future, with schemes to upgrade them, to help workers to reskill, to shift from old jobs to new ones. We have the professional conversion program. We have the place and train, adapt and grow, career support program. We are doing the right things, and it's making a difference. But I think we must know it's not going to be easy because change is happening fast, and I think it's going to be even faster. You take our crane operators, PSA container port, all the cranes, cranes over the ships, cranes in the yards. Skilled job. It used to be one crane, one operator. You climb up there, you are there, whole shift. You bring your lunch, you bring your meal, you want to ease yourself, you have to find your own solution. That was a good job, but a tough job. Then we found a way to operate the cranes remotely. You can sit in an office somewhere, video monitor, you control the cranes. Then you can control more than one crane simultaneously from your office. And now we've made it semi-automatic. You press the button, the crane starts moving. If it can do the job, it will do the job. If the computer is not smart enough, it will say, beep, human being, please help me. Human being will go and intervene. What it means is that one crane operator can now look after even more cranes. That's good, because he becomes more productive. But one day, the crane computer will be so smart, the operator can go on tea break, tea break the whole day. Then what happens? Then the operator will have to retrain him for a new job, one which he can do, which a computer cannot do. What will that be? And we will have to find that, work at that, and he will have to work at that, and we will have to go that way and let it happen when it happens because that's the way to prosper. That's the way we can continue to earn a living for ourselves. So change is happening and we will help people to change. At the same time, we are strengthening our social safety nets. We have chas. We have the Pioneer Generation Package. We have the MediShield Life. It's made healthcare affordable, accessible. We have CPF Life and Silver Support to look after the elderly. And we are building hospitals, polyclinics, social service centers to serve Singaporeans. And as our population ages, we will do more. But remember, Singapore will only be home if Singaporeans choose to make it our home. We are building up this home physically. Better public transport, parks, ABC waterways, a new Changi airport, a new mega port at Tuas. We are building new HDB towns, upgrading existing ones. They are full of life, 
There are homes for all our people. There are communities of Singaporeans. In Singapore, when you get married, we help you to own a home and to start a family. It's not so in any other major city in the world. If you're in London or New York or Hong Kong or Taipei or Seoul or Shanghai, housing is a big issue, especially for young people. But in Singapore, you start a family, you have a home. It's one way we make this home for all Singaporeans, but it's one reason also why Singaporeans feel this is home truly. That we are one united people, that we feel a sense of nationhood. We make common cause with our fellow Singaporeans and we are proud to be citizens of Singapore. Which brings me to my next point, and that is that for Singapore to be united, one home, one people, the PAP must be a strong national party. It works both ways. If our society is united, then it's easier for the PAP to represent a broad mass of Singaporeans and look after the interests of the broad mass of Singaporeans and not just a segment of Singaporeans. Conversely, if the PAP government pursues policies that benefit many Singaporeans across the board, bring Singaporeans closer together, then our society can remain united. But it's not going to be easy to do this because, because if you look around the world, the trend is in the opposite direction. Societies are fragmenting. People are splitting up into narrow groups, whether it's because of immigration or religion, left-wing versus right-wing issues, gender issues, conservatives versus liberals. Each one is a divide. And they split up. They're unable to find common ground with one another. So the result is that broad mainstream parties, traditional political parties, like the Labour Party in Britain or the Democrat Party in the US, they are weakening and the extreme groups are strengthening. Pressure groups are growing. And it's a vicious cycle. The societies are divided, becomes us versus them. The politics becomes dysfunctional. The legislatures gridlock, cannot make decisions. The governments are paralyzed. The Americans more than once had to shut down the government, cannot pay salaries. US government cannot pay salaries because Congress refused to vote the money. So, in other countries, the politics is splitting up. In Singapore, we must not let that happen. We are getting more diverse. People have different interests. They adopt different causes. They take different views on issues. We have nature groups, arts groups. We have conservatives and liberals argue on LGBT issues. We have groups focused on people with disabilities. We have groups which are pushing for particular sports, each one different. It makes for a vibrant civil society, makes for diversity and richness. And the diversity can be a strength, but only provided we doesn't, don't let this diversity divide us. We cannot be split. We are here today because right from the very start, the PAP put forward a vision of a multiracial society. And we committed ourselves to ensuring that no segment is left behind. People understood this, supported our vision, and the vision has not changed. So for Singapore to continue to be prosperous, to be strong, we must have the PAP continue to be a strong, united, national party. What do we have to do? First of all, we have to be close to all segments of society, men and women of different races and religions, brothers and sisters in the labor movement, the older PMETs, older ones, the PMETs, and the millennial generation, the workers, the elderly and the young, the disadvantaged and vulnerable, as well as the successful and ambitious. The PAP has to cover a broad base, represent many groups among our MPs and our activists, reach out to every segment of society, identify with people, so that people identify with us. 
then we can be be we can be with be with you for you and for every singaporean secondly we must not forget we must serve the people because that is our duty in chinese you always say wei ren min fu simple words but serve the people we count it a privilege to serve we can't be like political parties in other countries where people join the party for the spoils because you enter politics you get payoffs you get contracts you get deals you're on the inside track you get personal benefits sometimes huge ones here if you join the pap you expect hard work and tough speeches but we must never slacken we cannot afford to take voters for granted it's people it's trust it's people knowing you and you caring for people and unless we have that deep in our dna we will not be able to hold our position in singapore we must have that every mp every activist every branch secretary take care of the people serve them well they will not let you down the party also must provide strong leadership for singapore a capable pap team for today also a deep bench as we build a team for tomorrow i'm glad that we've strengthened the leadership team in the last two general elections we've brought in good men and women the younger leaders have been very active they've taken on more responsibilities in the ministry they are running most party activities and i'm very happy that several of them were elected in the cc elections 2 years ago and i hope this time more of them will be elected into the cc and they will progressively take over from me and my older colleagues and that's how the pap can stay strong fight effectively and win elections within our branches and constituencies who is the best model for this i would give you one example someone who has fought a tougher fight than most and comrade sito ipin and his team from potong pasir potong pasir fell to the opposition in 1984 long time ago it was the year i came into politics our comrades in potong pasir after that fought many unsuccessful elections try and win it back fail keep on trying they soldiered on sito himself contested and lost twice in g2011 as sito what do you want to do he said i want to stay on fight here he stood he fought a third time and this time he won 114 votes I think he counted every single one of them. After that, Sito and his team covered the ground thoroughly. They were determined that there would not be another such na narrow outcome again. So, last year, 2015 GE, Sito retained his seat. This time, no anxiety at all. His team, led by Chua Kian Meng, who is getting a comp. commendation medal today and him they worked hard they did a good job they fought extra hard because they had lost before and they knew they could lose unless they worked and if they didn't go all out the voters will not be forgiving and that is the attitude we must have in every constituency in singapore we must all have this potong pasir spirit and especially important at this time with the world the way it is because we are entering into such an uncertain period we have to work harder to earn our living to keep singaporeans united and to take singapore forward we are here today because singaporeans have given us their trust never take it for granted never be complacent or arrogant never forget your duty or your ideals stand together shoulder to shoulder with you 
for you, for Singapore. Thank you very much.